It's December 21, 2008. This is Maximize Utility. Today I want to talk about macro models. That's models of the macro economy and the related monetary economy in the financial system. And if we have such models, maybe we can predict the stock market, for example. Maybe we can do good public policy. Or maybe we can just know about our society, know about other societies. But what do we really have in macro models? Beginners might think there's a whole science in macroeconomics and there are all kinds of rigorous models that we use. Are they really out there? So I'm going to say, uh, what are the models we have? What kinds of models do we have? Then I say, which in particular are the ones we use today? I'm going to say, how good are these models? Do they really work? Uh, are they robust? That's a term meaning, do they work out of sample? Do they work in different time periods? Do they work across different data sets? Is there cause and effect in these models? Is there really one thing pulling another thing? Or are they just correlations that we seemingly picked up on? And I'll tell you why it's an acute issue. Uh, we had a central banker, Alan Greenspan, who ran the U.S. Central Bank for 20 years. He didn't use models. He used intuition. He said models were subject to ad hoc factoring. Ad hoc meaning to this, meaning just take your model. It didn't work, so uh, take something that would explain something temporarily. Ad hoc factoring. On the other hand, when Ben Bernanke became chairman of the Fed, he started using a factor model that had over 150 indicators in it. And he supposedly was a believer that this model could give him some leg up on the macroeconomy that other people didn't have. Does Goldman Sachs still have a model that's just as good, perhaps rendering his policy ineffective? We'll ask questions like that. Now what I want to do is put all the models on the board first, and I say that a little sheepishly because I'm not going to put all the models up, I'm just going to put a, a, a sampling of them, and then I'll go into three models in great detail and we'll look at them and see what good do these models do? Do they really hold up? So let's put all the models on the board. And when I say models, I mean models. Some of them are just really rules of thumb. Some of them I call them constructs, not full-blown models. Or maybe they're just parables. And some of them are just simple numbers that we believe have some hold. And let's start with the most quintessential of macro models, y equals c plus i plus g. And that's the idea that GDP equals all that's consumed. You hear, all, hear that all the time. Plus all that's spent on investment, plus all that's spent by the government. You can also throw in NX, that's the net export sector. And this was the historical model of macro, and it would be built into gigantic systems of equations, like the Brookings model, where all these quantities here would be broken down to equations and sub-equations. Those macro models did not have a great uh, record of success. And what happened was they were criticized as being macro, that they were quantities that really didn't exist. And microeconomists came along and they said, well, you've got to get down to fundamental micro aspects. So that's why we cook up this fancy term here, DSGE models, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. They're kinds of macro models based on micro foundations. So we could put one on the board, very complicated, very hard to understand, but they'd have things in them like utility functions, production functions, household budget constraints. They may or may not have money in them because money's hard to work into a model. And they'd have a government sector. And again, it would be about constraints and about preferences and about utility. And it would purport to put micro into macro. You don't see people referring to that a lot in the press because they're complicated models and they've had limited success also. Let's look at some things maybe you're familiar with, uh, some more rules of thumb and parable relationships. I'll put down a, a three of them. The Phillips curve, Oaken's law, and the sacrifice ratio. The Phillips curve is a relationship between inflation and unemployment. The Oaken's law is a relationship between unemployment and GDP growth. And the sacrifice ratio is a quantification of the Phillips curve, relationship between inflation and unemployment. Now, the Phillips curve is very famous. It held, it held, it held for a long, long time. We started to work with it in the 1960s, and then it blew up. It no longer held. Some people still believe in the Phillips curve. If the unemployment rate goes down and down and down, expect inflation to say, is that really a legit model? Let's look at something a little simpler that maybe you can relate to. GDP growth. We talk about GDP growth being 3% in the society, like as though it has some kind of hold. Some people say, oh, the trend growth has gone down a little bit. They say it's 2.8%. Well, where do we get that number from? And does that number have a real lot of hold? You can talk about something out of the world of financial economics, the price-earnings ratio. Long ago, in the 1970s, coming into the 1980s, that was supposed to be about 10. Never buy a stock with a P.E. ratio over 10. And don't expect the stock market to have a P.E. ratio that averaged more than 10. But then the stock market started to go up and up and up and up and up. And the greatest stock market guru of them all, Jeremy Siegel, said, hey, it's okay for the P.E. ratio to be about 18. That makes a very, very fundamental difference in how much things are worth out there. Anyway, now it looks like the P.E. ratio might be a little bit lower, but did that thing ever have any real hold? Now, let's look at a bunch of other models. Let's look at a few more models. Now remember, I'm not trying to overwhelm you here, but usually we say, what model is that person using? We go to an economist and he says, oh, 
the uh, president of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, is an inflation targeter. Is Trichet an inflation targeter? If so, why? Uh, does he uh, really believe any of these models? Anyway, here's a bunch more models we can uh, kick around. We have various kinds of monetary models. MV equal PQ, you probably remember that. That's the so-called quantity equation. Uh, we often look at money supplies, M1 and M2, and just see how they track. We can talk about doing inflation targeting, that the purpose is to keep inflation at a certain level, and the central bank should try to target the level of inflation and do nothing other. For example, don't try to target the level of unemployment. And we can also talk about the, I say, a uh, neutral rate. And that would be an overnight lending rate in a society that would neither stimulate the economy nor contract the economy. Maybe we're trying to get to that. Maybe that's what's in the head of a central banker. We can also talk about a quantity called NIRU or NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, somewhat similar to the Phillips curve. That's the rate of unemployment below which we would expect inflation to go up. In the 1990s, people said, oh, that was seven. We blew right through seven. They said, oh, it was six. We blew right through six. They said, oh, five is a rock bottom number. We, we blew right through five. Then we can talk about uh, models more so out of the book of macroeconomics, like ISLM, a very popular model. Aggregate supply, aggregate demand. It sounds like a micro model of supply and demand, but it's very, very different. And we can talk about growth theory. That's a long-run model of an economy. And then what I'm going to do now is do three models in great detail, three relatively prominent models, see if they hold up. Uh, some people rely on them a real lot. I'm going to do the Taylor rule. I'm going to talk about the Fed model. And I'm going to talk about the inverted yield curve.